Good afternoon. My name is Miles Burdine. I work for the Kingsport Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome to our federal legislative luncheon with our Congressman Phil Rowe. We do this every year and we look forward to it every year. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, our Mayor, Honorable Dennis Phillips, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Man, that doesn't have to say stand or anything. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. And contrary to what some of you are saying out there, he really didn't know all the words to the pledge. <laughs> Jim Rogers said, if you just say, I pledge, we'll fill in the rest of it from there. So. Also, before we get started, I'd like to thank our 2012 government relations sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, if you look to, our, uh, to my right, Mary Begley from Appalachian Power, Alan Hill from AT&T, Charlie Floyd from Domtar, and of course, Congressman Rose, not a sponsor, but we're here to honor you, Teresa Lee with Eastman Chemical Company, Danny Kars, who asked me to borrow a tie when he walked in <laughs> from the Edinburgh Group, Monty McLaurin with Mountain States Health Alliance, and Virginia Frank with Wilmot Health Systems. Thank you all. If you all join me at the same time. We also have representatives today from Senator Alexander's office. Uh, see Lana Moore is back there somewhere. Lana, if you raise your hand, there you go. Um, and we've also got uh, Bridget Baird from Senator Corker's office. Thank you, Bridget. John Abe Teague and Bill Snodgrass from Congressman Rowe's office. And uh, thank you all for being here. I also wanted to recognize the Kingsport Board of Mayor and Aldermen, led by our Mayor Phillips. I think your whole BMA is here. So uh, let's see. Tom Perham's back in the back. Vice Mayor Valerie Yeo, Mike McIntyre, John Clark, uh, Gentry Shoup, if I left anybody out. And of course, John Campbell, our city manager. And uh, one representative of our county commission, Mr. Bill Kilgore, is here. I don't think I left it. Bill? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Today you're going to hear an update on federal legislation from Congressman Rowe. As you know, Congressman Rowe recently received the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Spirit of Enterprise Award. Each year, the U.S. Chamber polls the American business community to find out how, uh, which issues matter most to them and then evaluates the members of Congress on how they vote on those issues. For these members who vote 70 percent or greater, receive the U.S. Chamber's coveted Spirit of Enterprise Awards. Congressman Rose received this every year since he's been in office. Congratulations and thank you very much, Congressman Rose. <laughs> it's now time for me, as your host, to introduce the introducer. Nobody got to introduce me, but Congressman Rose, we're here to, here to hear your message, to learn from you, to honor you. And I'm sure you'll agree that being introduced by Mr. Jim Rogers is a significant symbol of the respect our community and region have for what you do and what, what you stand for. So please lay, allow me a few minutes to say some good things about Mr. Jim Rogers. And Jim, I hope I got all this correct. Your handwriting wasn't real good, so <laughs> couldn't read it all. So. Okay. Jim Rogers and I have something in common with Congressman Rowe something of which we are very proud, and that's our military background. Jim served our country as a fighter pilot in the United States Navy. Now, only a small percentage of America's military are selected to fly those fast movers. Elite is a word that comes to mind. Now, I've listened to Jim speak, and I've watched him lead for many years. His military experience is always apparent. He is confident, he's determined, and he's very direct. There's never a doubt in the efforts and results he expects from those with whom he works. Jim Rogers leads by example. He has a keen sense of humor. He accepts all adversity as opportunities. He is positive and he is enthusiastic. He asks nothing of anyone that he has not done or was willing to do so himself. When a difficult decision needs to be made, regardless of how unpopular it may be, Jim will make that decision. He will step forward and loudly proclaim that he did so. Jim, what you have done for the employees and owners of East Smith Chemical Company what you have meant to our community, to our region, and to our state simply cannot be overstated. With Jim today is his lovely wife, Laura. If, Laura, you'll raise your hand. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll join me in... She, 
She got a bigger applause than you're going to get, I think. So. If you'll join me in welcoming to the podium uh, the chairman and CEO of Eastman Chemical Company, Mr. Jim Rogers. Thank you. I didn't realize we had that many Eastman employees out there. Thank you. <laughs> and Miles, thanks, thanks for that introduction. I've, all the introductions I've had in my life, that is by far, uh, by far the most uh, recent. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. I told him to keep it short. He's always trying to make me look bad. I got about two or three lines for this fellow, and, he, uh, and I'm going to keep this short because I'm looking at the average age of this crowd, and you're all on your second glass of iced tea, so <clears throat> I don't want Phil to have to cut it short. Uh, look, I think, they asked me to, I think they asked me to do this because they know I have this memorized by heart, and uh, and that's a labor of love. I really like this person on my left right here. Uh, and if you don't know his background, shame on you for being in this room. Uh, but let me tell you anyway. So he's a, he's a Tennessean, Austin P. State University and University of Tennessee for medical degree. And then two years in uh, that other service uh, besides the Navy Marine Corps Air Force. And uh, served his country. And I love that about him. Uh, 30 years as a doctor uh, delivering babies. They, the number they say is close to 5,000. And a lot of times I say delivering voters and I catch myself. But I thought I'd, I thought I'd ask him. He didn't know he was going to get a pop quiz. But here's what I want you to do, Phil. I want you to think about the year you delivered the last, your last baby. What election will that child be able to vote in? Let's see. Let me think about that. I mean, probably I got to run one one more time. So <laughs> is that right? <laughs> well, now you know. It's a re-election has been announced. Uh, for, I I just think that's fantastic. And then, and you know, not only a doctor, but that means he was also is a small business person. And I think we can uh, identify with that. Um, and I think that's pretty important at this time in our country's history with what we're facing in terms of jobs and the economy, it's good to have someone who not only has that expertise on the medical side, but has an understanding of what it takes to run a small business. Uh, came back to service to his community in Johnson City as vice mayor and mayor, and then in 2009 into the house. God bless him. I don't, I, I'm sure he didn't know what he was in for when he went to that town, Washington, D.C., but we are so fortunate to have him. He gets involved in veterans affairs and in education and workforce with the committees he's on. And, uh, and one of the things we all love about this country is he senses the obligation to come back and talk to the people and tell them what's going on there. So with that, let me turn it over to our representative, Phil Rowe. Thank you very much. I normally, I've, well, since I, I'm going to start out with, but we took a little shot, us Army guys. So um, I was on a trip after I'd been to Afghanistan back to, um, back over to Bethesda, Walter Reed Hospital to visit the wounded warriors. And as you mentioned, uh, being at the age many of us are, I need to go to, we call it the latrine after we're through. And so I go into the latrine there at, at Bethesda, Navy place. And there's a sign over the latrine that says, do not drink from the latrine, it's flushed with rainwater. And I said, you know, I'm thinking, I'm an old army guy, if it didn't flush with Perrier water, I wasn't thinking about drinking out of the latrine. So I go outside to the Navy guys and I said, well, what's with this sign? I give anything, I've got to go back and get a picture of it. They said, oh, Doc, don't worry. I said, that's for, the, that's for the Navy guys, you'd have to draw a picture for the Marine Corps. So anyway, <laughs> enough said about that. Um, so I, I, we, uh, on Saturday, and Bill Kilgore was down there, just to let you all know, uh, we have Academy Day, and we had it in uh, Morristown uh, this week, and uh, this year, I mean, and Bill Snodgrass and John Abe and all have done such a great job. I think we have between 150 and 175 people out there for that. Young people came from all over to learn about the military, and I learned a few things I want to share with you that, that really have nothing to do with what I'm going to say today, but... Carson Newman College, that small college down there in, in uh, Jefferson City, they produce more nurses for the military than any other college in the country. 
That's astonishing. East Tennessee State University, since it's had an ROTC program, has produced over 1,400 officers for the U.S. military and eight generals. So it's, I mean, and I'm talking about some very significant generals, and those are things I learned something new each year. But let me tell you, when you worry about the country and the direction we're going in and where we're going to be, when you go see days like that, you know the country has great young people, and it's, it's important for us as leaders in the country to get out and meet these young people who are our future leaders and encourage them. We're in good shape in America. Let me tell you, we're producing some astonishing young people. I'm... Um, I'm going to do some things, talk about some things today I, uh, that I haven't in a while and here, and I think it's especially apropos for this uh, group being in the chamber, being the job creators. Small business people that create over half the jobs in this country, over 200,000 of them have gone out of business in the last four years. Think about how many jobs that are, maybe from two or three people to uh, 20, 30 people have gone out of business in their jobs. And I looked, and I want, wanted to look at this recession we're currently in. I'm going to talk about that first and look at it compared to all the recessions, the 10 of them, since World War II. And obviously the one that was the, the worst was the Great Depression of uh, the, the 1930s. What was amazing was we went into that depression in the 30s with a 3% unemployment rate. I didn't realize that. And it took all of the 30s and part of the 40s in World War II to get us out of that. And the, if you look back and look at the acts of government, they probably kept us in that recession longer and depression than we otherwise would have been by government policies, as you have a, a, a rearview mirror view of that. Well, let me go through the, the ones that we all maybe mo no, know more about. And I certainly know about the, the uh, 70s recession. I was in a recession myself at that time. I was in the Army and was a resident in uh, Memphis. And if you had a paycheck like that, you were in a current, in a depression, really, because you didn't make enough money to, to barely. Uh, I made, as, a, as an intern, I made $280 a month. And I probably was overpaid. But anyway, I thought I was worth a little more than that. Um, if you look at the 70s and then 80s, and the reason 80 reception, uh, recession hit me so clearly was when I bought my first house. And, and uh, we had an unemployment rate, and I'm going to go over some just numbers briefly, and I've had to write them down because I want to be sure I got them right. Uh, in, the, in the 30s, our unemployment rate got up as high as 25% in this country. Um, it may be upwards of, un, of discouraged workers and unemployed workers, it may be approaching that number now. Uh, if you look at the uh, 1970s, 1980s, 1980 recession, we went into that recession with a 5.8% unemployment rate. It got up to 105 And it took, if you look at every recession we've been in since World War II, the average has been about six years to get back to where employment was when you went into that recession. This one, remember, this recession started in 2007. And we're in 2012 right now, and we're vastly underemployed compared to where we were in any other recession we've had since World War II. So I think the question you have to ask is, is that how do you recover from a recovery? If we're in a recovery now, how do you, how do you kickstart the economy? Do you continue to do the same policies that you have, or do you change horses? Do you do, do something different? Uh, me personally, if I've been running up the middle in football and I'm not gaining any yards, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to throw the ball or I'm going to run around the end. I'm going to do something different because what we're doing now is we are in a stagnation that I don't think we can continue to do. We don't think we can go through four more years. How do you get out of where we are? And I think the, the, even the 2000 recession we had, people forgot we had a recession then. The reason I know about it was that's when I went on the city commission in Johnson City. So I saw the revenues dry up on a local level and us have to deal with that. So it was a recession. It also took six years. This one is the deepest and steepest we've had. But typically what happens when you have a deep recession is you climb out of it steeper. You climb out of it faster. And to give you an example, at two and a half years in the recession, the steep recession we had in 80 and 81, the re reason I remember that one so well, I bought my first house, I actually master charged a house. I mean, most people don't do that. 
but the interest rates were 15 percent. I mean, it's the same you pay on your MasterCard today. So I, I literally master charged the house I still live in today. And uh, thank goodness it doesn't have to be master charged anymore, but that's what the last 30 years has been about is paying it off. So I think a lot of people looked at that recession. What do we do during that time that worked so well that created millions of jobs and got us out of that? Well, we decreased uh, regulations in this country. We opened up the entrepreneurs and allowed them to go to work, the job creators. We decreased tax rates, and it worked like a charm. And we had the longest economic recovery we've had since World War II. So I'm, I mentioned that. So what can you do today? I don't think until you see housing get on its feet, until the housing market uh, gets out there where, where the banks uh, the, the credit people can lend money again easily and not be, uh, not have the, the hand of government placed on them. I think you can see that. If that happens, I think you're going to see it happen. And it's beginning to do it. We had the state realtors were here. Many of you probably were there. It was really a, a terrific to have one of our people elected to the uh, – Randy was elected as the, the, the uh, president of that organization this year. I think as you see housing get better, you'll begin to see a lot of things get better. So I think that's part of the recovery. And we've had, remember, that the QE3, the quantitative easing the Federal Reserve is doing, is on its third leg. This is number three. And they've said they'll inject $40 billion a month into uh, that sector to make sure that it continues to stay stable. The problem with QE, with quantitative easing, is this. It cheapens a dollar. And remember that oil is traded in dollars. And so when I can promise you if our dollar is worth less, Oil is going to go up. It has nothing to do with supply and demand. It has to do with the value of, do of dollars because that's how it's traded. If you're pumping oil out of the Middle East and you're getting less for your dollar, you're going to raise the price of the oil. Simple enough. And so I think that's another issue. Uh, certainly energy is a major, and I'm going to go back to my military time in 1973 in Korea. We had an oil crisis. I don't know whether you all remember it or not. We had lines. People here had lines. What I had was an eighth inch of sheet metal between me and freezing to death outside. I was in a Quonset hut 11 miles south of the DMZ in Korea, and we had the oil embargo came in, and we had to save all of our diesel and all of our fuel for our tanks and for our helicopters and for our armored uh, vehicles. And why? Because we were at the front of the tip of the sword. That's where we were, the tip of the spear, if a war broke out. So we got heat three hours a day in a Korean winter. Uh, we got heat two hours and one hour in the morning to take a shower and two hours at night. And at that point, I realized that, he, that energy policy is a national security issue in this country. Let me speak to it just a minute. I didn't look. At the, at the think tanks in Washington for this information that I'm giving you now. I went to the money people. I looked at the, at the Merrill Lynch's and the city corps who evaluate this for clients. And this is, if you want to read something, you may have heard me speak about it before, but March of this year, city corp put a great energy analysis out. It'll take you about an hour to read it, or you can read less if you just uh, read part of it. This, this, they say this, and they believe this, that we can in eight years be energy independent in this country, either in, a, in America only or certainly in North America. And with our Canadian friends and allies and with our allies in the South and Mexico, we can be completely energy independent. And what they believe, and I believe this, with cheap, inexpensive energy prices, that we'll be able to bring manufacturing back into this country. And I believe, coming, my father worked in a factory. Uh, he made shoe heels. I was very proud of what my dad did. He made the shoe heels that I used on my shoes to go to school. And I would tell people that. And he lost his job in 1973 when I was in the Army to Mexico. His job was exported. This has not just started. It's been going on for a long time. We believe, I believe, and they believe that stable energy prices, low energy prices, will help make us competitive in the world market. And I believe that. The Straits of Hormuz, which I have flown over, is 20 miles wide. It's 20 miles wide today. It'll be 20 miles wide 50 years from now. And when you've got a high percentage of the oil being going through the Straits of Hormuz, it wouldn't take much of a, of a war or an ignition uh, of, of a conflict in that area to close it off. If you close that off, oil will go to $150, $200 a barrel literally overnight because of the supply disruption.
And as you can see with what's going on in the Middle East now, that is a real possibility. I mean, you have Syria that's blowing up. You have Israel right now that's... I, I've, I have met personally Benjamin Netanyahu twice, a very impressive man. I remember sitting in his office in Jerusalem three years ago. And that man looked at us, there were about ten of us sitting in there, looked at us and said, Israel has a right to protect itself, and we will. And I believe he will protect that country. That is his job as the prime minister to protect the seven million Israelis living in, I tell you, in one of the most dangerous places, the most dangerous place, uh, second to North Korea in the world. They don't have a nuclear bomb now. I don't believe the world's going to get safer if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. So we've got the energy piece that I think is very doable. But we have policies right now that are preventing it from happening. Why in the world would you block the Keystone Pipeline when the Canadians want to sell us their energy? We have a bullseye on the coal industry. We know that our neighbors up in southwest Virginia and, and in West Virginia and in Pennsylvania, Alpha Natural Resources, one of the largest coal consortiums in the world, just laid off 1,250 people. I, I've looked at crowds of 1,250 people. It's not 1,250 people. It's thousands of people because those folks live in communities. They, they, uh, they buy cars at the local car dealerships. They go to the bank to borrow money for their homes, to fix their homes up. They, they uh, donate to the little leagues. They do all of those things that people with a job can do. In southwest Virginia, I tell you, if we continue the assault on our energy, like coal, carbon, it's going to be a wasteland in southwest Virginia. There are no other jobs. In West Virginia, that's it. It is the coal industry. So I believe we have to have policies, policies for energy independence. It's not going to be that hard to do. The technology is there. The resources are there. When you look at the, I mean, hundreds of billions hundreds of billions of, ga of uh, barrels of oil that are recoverable in this country. Natural gas, uh, and I think uh, uh, wind and solar where it's appropriate, absolutely use that. Any of the resources that you want to use and be good stewards of the environment. So I think we've got those things. Um, and by the way, I, I said this to you all before, but um, I, I keep my medical license current, so when I get through, anybody needs a Prozac prescription, I can take care of that if you get too depressed hearing this. Or, you, uh, Gentry told me you come out to his funeral home and get an uplift. It's more uplifting at the funeral home than it is what I'm going to tell you today. Um, I, I think where there are great challenges, I think where there are great challenges, I think the American people are up to those challenges, and I think they're ready to do it. We have too many of our fellow citizens that are out of work. Uh, I've, I've been in uh, Colorado, I was in North Carolina, been in Southwest Virginia, I'm going to New York State next month uh, to, to visit and talk to the people there. And I think, I believe that the solutions are there. And I think those solutions are smaller, smaller government, and I'm going to pass along to you, and I've said this before to, to many of you in this group, uh, the September of last year, one of the most important pieces of legislation got passed uh, by a fellow named Jeff Davis. He's a congressman from Kentucky. And it's called the RAINS Act. And it absolutely is imperative that we get this passed and put into law. And I'll, I'll go over just in a minute why. It's a law that says if we in Congress pass a bill and then the rule makers, when they start writing the rules for all these bills, write rules that affect the U.S. economy by more than $100 million, that that legislation has to come back to the Congress for approval. That is extremely important. Flash uh, forward the health care bill. If 2,700 pages wasn't enough for that thing, they've already written 13,000 pages of rules that we have to, that everyone has to dig through and spend money and find out how do you make this work. And uh, there's one Fortune 500 company I know in this room. I spoke to the CEOs of two last Monday. And all, both of them said, look, we just need to know what's going to happen. We can even deal with bad news if we just know what the news is. Right now, we don't know how to deal at all. So it's the uncertainty, I think, out there with business that they need. Uh, let me also say that this, if, if you hear about this being a do-nothing Congress, that's actually giving do-nothing a bad name. Um, it, I, I, look, I look at, uh, if, if you think you're frustrated, 
you ought to be behind my steering wheel when I go down the road and get phone calls from business people and so forth. Here we are with an election coming in six weeks. This is all the Congress. Remember, at least 55 of them are not going to be back in the House. I don't know how many in the Senate. Uh, and and I, I wish I could write down the ones I didn't want back, but they don't let you do that in a free society. But anyway, this is what's on our plate. We have a farm bill. Okay, sounds pretty real. Got a farm bill. Hadn't been done. We've got the Bush, the tax cuts that are going to go uh, off July, January 1. Businesses don't know what their tax rates are going to be. Got that. We got the inheritance taxes. We've got sequestration, which are the automatic cuts, and that's the fiscal cliff you hear them talking about. If, if, the, if the sequestration takes place with $1.2 trillion in cuts and the taxes go up at the same time, that is the cliff you go off of. And I think another recession is inevitable if that happens. So what are we doing? Nothing, because we can't get anything passed. Oh, and I forgot, uh, the doctors are scheduled to have a 27% uh, cut in their Medicare payments come January 1. If that happens, I'm on Medicare. I, can, I guarantee you they're going to slam the door in my face. And so we've got all of these things on our plate, and we're home campaigning. It's really embarrassing to be up here telling you that. Um, this government is not functional and working right now, at least the way it should, I don't think. There are parts of it that are, uh, certainly, but many parts of it are not. If you think that the government is not big enough and not involved enough in your day-to-day -day doings about, I get a call, and I don't think you'll mind, uh, mind me saying who it was, Jack Parton, who's the school director down in Sevier County. And Jack calls up and said, Doc, I'm having to count tater tots. I said, you're having to do what? And he, he said, he said, now because of all the new rules in school nutrition, see, we've got our kids are too fat, so we're going we're gonna, to, the government's gonna, not going to leave it to the parents and to the school system, the local people, to figure that out. For instance, over in Johnson City, up in Adam, a program we've got going over there for the last five or six years. So we've got that going on. So now he's having to count out how many tater tots a kid can eat and before they can be fed. It, that was that is so ridiculous I almost couldn't keep my automobile on the road when I heard it and he had to count six french fries for one kid and he said Phil he said the problem with it is on Friday this is the last decent meal that some of these kids are going to get until Monday and he said what I'm going to do is feed these kids I said good for you Jack and I'll be right there with you trying to help you make sure that we don't have a bureaucrat telling you what to do Look, I, I, I'm all for physical fitness. I try to exercise regularly and be in shape. Mayor Bloomberg uh, in the nanny state of New York has said you can't buy anything more than a 16-ounce Coke, and you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, he was up to speak to us about a year ago, and when he shows up again, I'm going to show up with a bag of pork rinds and a 32-ounce Coke. I don't need to do either one, but I'm going to do that for him. And I'm going to eat every one of them and drink it all with him sitting there. And, and I talked to a couple of friends of mine who said, will you share your pork rinds? And I said, well, absolutely I will. Um, we have obviously an important election. I, th I believe this, and as I conclude, I, I believe if with the right policies, there's enough money out there on the sidelines ready to invest. I think we have tremendous opportunity in the business sector, and that is the way you grow it out. We had a, a debate on the House floor about uh, welfare to work and having people work. That's a program that President Clinton signed that actually worked well. We had 5 million families on welfare, and now it's down to 1.7 million, but unfortunately going back up. And what some of the people were arguing is, is that some states had put in there that work was journaling massage, bed rest. I said, you know, writing that I watched The View today, we don't think it's work in East Tennessee. Uh, and that, that was actually considered work, so people would qualify. Well, that, that's a travesty when you see that. And what my opponent, uh, one of my friends, actually Rob Andrews, I serve on the uh, Health, Employment, Labor, and Pension Subcommittee with Rob, great guy from, from New Jersey. He said, what we need to do is we need to be sure and hire more teachers and firefighters and all this, and that'll stimulate growth when this government spending. 
And I said on the House floor, I said, you know, this is a, a, a fine thing to do, but you've got it exactly backwards. And let me explain to you. As a city, just a local, small town, East Tennessee government official, we had three consecutive years. I said, we don't have income taxes in the state. We have property taxes and we have sales taxes. So if business does well, we do well. We had three consecutive years of $200 million in building permits. I said, Rob, what I understood was when we put those building permits out there, I knew those taxes were going to come in because we knew that the property taxes people were going to pay. Many of those properties were commercial properties that were going to produce sales taxes. What he would do would produce the revenue that I could then go hire these people and pay the bills and not do it with deficit spending. I said, you guys have got it exactly 180 degrees backwards. If we unleash the people in this room, the folks that create the jobs that I'm looking at right here, the chamber people, this country will be very successful, as we have been for 200 years. So that's the, the policies, and I think the less we can do, actually, quite frankly, as I was going out of town, I thought, this may be the safest time because we can't hurt you when we're down here. We, 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 we can't harm you. So really, for the next six weeks, you're safe. Um, first of all, and lastly, I mean, thank you for what you do every day. You go out there and you're, I know with the regulatory burdens you have, with all the hoops you have to jump through, it's amazing how successful we are. And having been in China and Korea and India and so forth in the last three months, I'm amazed you're able to do as well as you're able to do and provide what you do. Um, if I'm given the opportunity to return to Congress, I'm going to work very hard in the committee structure I have to be sure you can do that and do what you do well. And again, Miles, thanks very much for, for having me here today. Appreciate it. We have a few more minutes. The uh, floor is open for questions. Okay, I'll throw out the first one. Your thoughts on the upcoming election? Uh, well, I, I, how political can I be? <laughs> I, I, think, I think we have, uh, I think it's obviously everybody in this room watches TV like I do, and it is going to be a close election. Uh, we were over in North Carolina um, Saturday, and I think probably North Carolina is going to go for Romney. I don't think there's much doubt in my mind about that. This election is going to come down to four or five states like it usually does, Florida, Ohio, uh, Virginia, probably in Iowa or Wisconsin, Colorado, those states, maybe even in New Hampshire. Uh, those five, six, seven states, I think, are the ones going to make the decision. Uh, it's, people are just now beginning to pay attention. Uh, the election is going to be determined, as it always is, by independent voters who are about six, eight percent of the electorate. Uh, you know, the left-wing nuts and the right-wing nuts like me have all made our minds up, and so the, the, uh, the, the, the election will be decided by those folks. I think the debates, uh, Miles, are going to be huge this time. I think um, people are going to really pay attention on those, and I'm very interested. Of course, um, Paul Ryan is a friend, and uh, I've never had a friend have the chance of being vice president of the United States. And I talked to him last week, and he told me, he said, um, I asked him, did you see this coming? And he said, he said, really not. He said, uh, I knew I had been vetted. I mean, they had looked at him, but he truly did not, not see it coming. He is a very bright young guy. I know Governor Romney, but I know Paul Ryan very well. And he's got a little boy named Sam. He's his six-year-old son, and, and Sam sat down next to me about a, six weeks ago and voted for me 18 times, I think, one night. So he put my card in, punched the button, and... Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be a close election. Obviously, I think it's a very, very important election. And um, it's really a vision, I think, of, of two different visions of America, which direction we should go. Uh, one of a bigger government, more government intrusion, or one with a smaller government, more personal liberty and freedom. Other questions? Sir, buddy. Uh, 
You know, we, we have, um, what we need to do is have more people in this country working and a broader tax base. It's not going to solve the, I mean, you can raise taxes on, on the entrepreneurs and the wealth creators, if, and, and that will raise some revenue. I don't know how much negative effect it will have. It will not solve the problem. And, uh, I mean, it's just not going to. I've looked at the numbers. It won't happen. You need more people paying taxes. That's as simple as that. Um, when we were debating this, I had no idea that, uh, the, uh, this number, but this came up. It just for, was fortuitous that when he made the statement, two days before we'd had the uh, debate in our committee on education workforce on uh, welfare and work. There are 106 million people in this country, and I'm not talking about Medicare and Social Security. I'm talking about just a some form of direct government payment that get a direct government payment in this country, 106 million people. So it is astonishing. And let me, um, I say this, and, and there's some truth to it. I, I have a lady that I know at TSA, and my, the TSA folks out here at the airport know me as, let me, let's put it this way. The TSA people at Tri-Cities know me better than my urologist does. And so if you've had the experience of going through, well, one of the ladies who works there works two jobs. And she works at TSA part-time and she works at Walgreens part-time. And every week I go through there, she shares with me some other experience she's had at Walgreens. The last week was, and, and there are people who need assistance. There's not anybody in this room that doesn't recognize that through the church we go to, United Way, whatever. We know there's a need out there. She said, Dr. Rose, she said, last week a lady came in with her food stamp card and bought a hundred dollars worth of checks Mix. The, the week before, somebody came in and bought seventy dollars worth of Coca Cola's and candy, Reese's Cups, M&Ms, and so forth. That, that's an affront to hard-working people out here that are having, like her, work two jobs. So, um, the 47 percent, I don't know whether that's the exact number, and I probably would have said it a little differently, but we are building a dependency in this nation. There's no question about it. One other, one other thing I didn't mention and, and I wanted to, the net, and this is for the, the folks in the, in, the, in the banking business and the credit business. One of the next big credit things we've got to deal with in this, in this country are school loans. Uh, the school loan debt now surpasses credit card debt in this country. It's over a trillion dollars. And the biggest predatory lender in the United States is the United States Department of Education. 6.8% interest when those loans, if they were floated at market rate, you guys out there in that business could do it at three probably or three and a half and probably do for some students who are credit worthy. So we've got to get the government out of that business too. And let the people know what they're doing to it. Other questions? Let him off easy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I else like but your like house. Miles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congressman, thank you very much. And I want to say also thank you once more to our uh, sponsors, um, Appalachian Electric Power, AT&T, Domtar, uh, Eastman Chemical Company, Edinburgh Group, Mount States Health Alliance, and, of course, Wellmont. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a great day here in Kingsport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.